the same for other guys that were going pro. I mean, when you're recruiting, do you try to target guys that we think they'll actually make it to campus? How aggressive are you with guys who you think might actually turn pro? And I guess it's ties in with the portal. Does it help now that you have four available, um, possibly better players to replace if you're losing guys? In the yeah, so I think we all watched the World Series and there was a lot of talk of glorifying the portal as, you know, and some teams maybe rely on it. We will, we will always build our program with high school players, always. And we are gonna build the program by recruiting the high school player, developing the high school player, and we are gonna go into the portal to fill some holes, plug some gaps, plug some holes, fill some gaps. Um, kind of like we, we used to do back in the day with junior college players. And then, the, you know, it used to be if you transferred, you had to sit out a year, so you really didn't do the four-year transfer thing, you know, in the last, whatever it's been, 15 years. Um, but w the majority of the guys we've got coming in are grad transfers. And this will, this will actually be the first time that we've brought in someone that's not a grad transfer. Uh, but I, I think, you know, there, there has to be some type of extenuating circumstance for us, at least, as to why to... Uh, to target someone or to get someone that isn't a graduate transfer. I just personally, you know, gravitate to the grad transfer. Just like, like that the guy did his, his four years at that at the other school, got his degree, uh, he's got a bit of a chip on his shoulder because he's, he's not drafted, he's not pro ball, he's still in college, and uh, he's got one shot, one shot at being a part of a winner. And those guys, whether it was at Michigan or last year with the guys we had, specifically Riley Bertram and Willie Weiss, but those guys have just, uh, they, they're just willing to, to do anything to make sure the team goes out a winner and their last year as a college baseball player is a very memorable one. So uh, we've mostly just, you know, targeted the grad transfer, but now that the post-COVID window is closing, the COVID bonus year, I think the transfers will probably shift back to, you know, just the straight undergrad transfer. And I'm not saying we won't, ever do it and we did it this year with a couple guys coming in but um, it would it just you know it would have to be the, a very specific need that needs to be filled and a, a very specific uh, reason why you know I'm just not a, a guy that thinks that we're going to get someone who is disgruntled over here and looking at you know thinking this is a greener grass type of situation I, Jerry Weinstein the former Sacramento City College coach had a great line. He said, the grass is brown everywhere. It's only green where you water it, right? So, uh, yeah, I just, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll build our program with high school players. Right? Yes. We'll supplement the transfers as needed. Yeah. With the draft, though, is it, is it difficult as a coach to, you know, not target kind of those guys who may be going pro? And, and how do you make those decisions in terms of? Yeah, so it's, you know, we, we kind of subscribe to the idea that you can't coach them if you never sign them. I mean, we uh, going all the way back to you know recruiting at Vanderbilt with Coach Corbin. Uh, we targeted some some big time guys, and uh, we lost some of them. But the ones we got were transformational for the program. Guys like David Price. I mean, David Price could have signed for a seven figure signing bonus out of high school, but he chose to come to school. And so, you know, I think we we will always target those types of players. Clemson historically has always targeted those types of players. And, uh, you know, and then you have some that come in and, and you know, really blossom and, and, uh, and have turned into, you know, to create uh, quite a career for themselves. But yeah, we will always go after the high-end player. And this is, a, this is a place that every prospect should be interested in just with the, the fan base, the facilities, the development of our program, uh, the, the way our players develop in our program, you know, having winning teams and a winning culture, it's just it's going to be highly attractive for kids throughout the southeast, state of South Carolina, Georgia, Florida, North Carolina, all the way up to the northeast. I mean, those, you know, we'll, we'll continue to recruit probably a 50-50 mix of out-of-state, in-state. So I think if you're on the eastern seaboard, you know, from tip of Florida all the way to the tip of Maine, this is going to be a desirable place to come to.
found it. I thought it was interesting the way you, you talked about Will Taylor and understanding the, you know, the, the money is on the back end of this. Cam Canarella put together a special season, and you have to imagine that there were a lot of teams across the country that wanted to, to come in and get him. But he decided to stay the course, and to me that's kind of, again, looking long-term rather than something short-term. How big is it to have him back and the fact that he's, you know, staying? Oh, yeah. And I, I love Cam. I love his family, and I appreciate the loyalty as well because there was tampering going on with him, and there were, you know, third parties, and that's how it's done. It's never done from direct coach to player. It's, the, you know, the third-party stuff. Um, and, but he, he, he's – he held his ground and he stuck his feet in and their family uh, realized that he's, he's not only grown as a baseball player but as a person and his friends are here and he's thriving here and you know you don't want to mess with success and he's, he's very successful here and um, he's really uh, you know made a name for himself in short order so yeah it's exciting to think um, you know about his trajectory and about the the career that he can build for himself on that trajectory uh, and being able to play this great game for a long, long time. You know, I love his fire and I love his competitiveness and I you know, don't want him to, to lose that for one second because it's, uh, it's what makes him great. Um, and he's awesome and we love having him. I'm glad he's on our team and staying on our team. Could he play shortstop if, if you needed him to? He, he can play anywhere. Cam, Cam Canarella can <laughs> play infield, outfield, pitch and catch. He's just one of those, he's a ball player, you know. He's just got that it factor and yeah, but he's, uh, you know, sure looks like he's found a home in center field. He does that very well. How do you evaluate Ethan Darwin's freshman season and just what do you feel like is the senior or sorry, the ceiling for him? You know, kind of that same thing as a guy who, who came in and just continued to grow and improve and, and, and progress quickly. And again, for him, it's a, a lot of that same competitive fire that Cam Canarella has. Ethan Darden has all of that as well. Uh, and I think a lot of that has to do with their upbringing and just some of their life experiences up to this point. Uh, but he's a perfect example of a guy that his role at the beginning of the season did nothing but improve as the season went on because he maximized his opportunities as a margin guy and as a matchup guy and as a short reliever and as a long reliever. And then before you know it, he's getting Tuesday starts in the midweek. And then before you know it, he's pitching on Fridays. Um, and so he's just, his mentality, I think, is what uh, his biggest strength more than just the way his ball sinks and runs and his secondary stuff. So I see him continuing to make these these strides um, physically to his body as his, he has another birthday, another trip around the sun, and gets uh, adds some more strength, adds some more weight. His stuff continues to improve. His command continues to improve, but he keeps that same mindset. That's where you know you see guys like that just take a jump and, and reach another level. But you know we trust him, and there's a reason why we he was pitching on the weekends for us. You end a season, people always have to get stuff cleaned up, get healthy. How are you health-wise heading into fall ball? Uh, I think we've got some bumps and bruises and nicks and scrapes. Um, you know, so, you know, it's, uh, yeah, I think there's some guys that are going to need some time off that have gone off and, and done well in the summer. And, um, but um, that's the other thing. That's the exciting thing, too. We've had some guys go off and have great summers, um, guys all-star type summers. Uh, at the, in their respective leagues, uh, Nolan Naraki, Nate Hall, Cooper Blouser, guys who, you know, Cooper and, and Nolan saw no action last year. Nate saw limited action, but these guys all went off and kicked butt in their summer leagues. Uh, and, and there's others in that, in that grouping as well. So excited about what they're doing coming back. But then there's another group that, you know, Austin Gordon pitched a lot last, last year. He went off to Team USA with Cam Canarella. He pitched some there. He, started last night in the Cape. He's throwing about 10 more innings in the Cape. So, you know, there'll be some guys that, you know, it's not necessarily that are managing injuries. It's more us taking measures to prevent those injuries um, so from overuse. And, and uh, so just really, you know, there'll be, there'll be a lot more, I think, of that um, uh, as a, a topic of conversation. You may, you may not see some guys, you know, pitcher 
or do things as much in the fall just because they're on a different timeline getting ready for next season? I guess specifically, I believe Marlo, just the guy I've had arm issues and shoulder issues during the season, I guess now physically, is there hope that he'll be available? Oh, yeah, we're excited about Billy. He, uh, yeah, he was the bad luck recipient of just kind of having one one thing after the next, and we, we uh, you know, we weren't really sure because on all the testing, you know, there wasn't, it didn't look like a lot of structural, uh, you know, or structural problem, like there wasn't a tear in this ligament or that tendon or whatever, but it, it turns out, that, you know, they went in and, and had it looked at to get it cleaned up, and there were some things to clean up, um, and so he's been, he's been rehabbing aggressively, and he'll be, he'll be back at it, and, and return to form, so you remember in the fall, he was 95, 96, and pitching well in the fall, and was very much a candidate to be a weekend starter. So we're looking at him uh, very much as a candidate uh, in that weekend rotation or in our starting rotation uh, next year. And, and Billy brings an element of, you know, he's he's not only super hyper competitive, but you know he keeps everybody loose and he's a character and he's a great teammate. And even though he wasn't able to to play at the end there, um, you know he was a kind of an invaluable guy that we just had to have. And needed his voice and needed his positive energy because he adds a lot of value with all of that. I guess in terms of the recruiting class, um, how many of these guys were people that you recruited while you were at Michigan? And how do you make that choice in terms of how to want to bring them over to the Clemson recruiting class as opposed to they were guys recruiting at Michigan? Yeah, there's a couple uh, Michigan kids that were committed to Michigan that flipped over, two Michigan kids in particular. Um, but yeah, I mean, all the names, all the guys, like, you know, it's our job. Coach Schnabel does an unbelievable job of, of having a pulse on all the top players in the country. So there were some pieces in this class, um, you know, coming in that um, that absolutely, yeah, we, we recruited at Michigan but didn't get and lost to Clemson on them. And now we're glad that we lost them to Clemson. Um, but everyone coming in, I mean, this is a – this is a very good class coming in. And then obviously identified some needs, uh, you know, with some transfers out of the portal. But, you know, we feel, feel really good about this class and we think, you know, with what we've got coming back and who we've got coming in, um, you know, there's no reason why we can't take that next step. Coach, we were talking to uh, some of the Clemson football coaches that were just coming in and they were saying as much preparation as they did they didn't understand fully what the job was until they were thrown into the fire. So what are some of the things you learned last year that you're grateful to actually have done the job that you're trying to carry into this upcoming season? Um, you know, the the fan base here and the community here is, I'm, I'm really glad that we took the approach last fall of being active in the community. Uh, and doing the community service type work that we did. I think it allowed us to build a lot of relationships, in some cases repair some relationships, uh, but just getting out there and doing events for children, uh, for the elderly, for the night to shine and, and some special needs folks um, and students. Uh, just, just being, you know, student athletes that are seen as student athletes that want to give and not all about just getting. Um, I think resonated with this community because this, you know, Clemson family means something to a lot of people. And so feeling like we are contributive uh, members of this Clemson family was, was very important. So, you know, that's something I'm, I'm glad our team did and will continue to do and maybe even do it at, a, at even a higher clip. Uh, this fall, this winter, and this spring. Uh, but just getting engaged with the Clemson community and the Clemson family, that was, uh, that was awesome. And that was a, a, a very, uh, very important part of our success, especially seeing how our fans showed up there at the end. Anything else for Coach? All right, thank you, Coach.